And this is the 100th episode of The Question Is. The Question Is, from Thinking Focus. Hi, I'm Paul from Thinking Focus. Hi, I'm Rich. Hi, I'm Ricky. Hi, I'm Rob. And this is the 100th episode of The Question Is. Yay! Yeah, Finally. So enthusiastic. <laughs> Finally. Finally. It's not the last one. Right? Oh, def- well, well. <laughs> That's what the goal was to get to 100. Yeah, I think we get to the end of the recording and work out if it's the last one or not, to be fair. It's astonishing, though, isn't it? 100. Brilliant. Well done, us. Yeah. It's taken some doing. Uh, right. So this time, I'm going to do something slightly different. The question that we want to focus on is, what's the best piece of advice you would give? And what I thought we'd do um, is break that down into the four areas we work. So... Um, want to talk about productivity, leadership, culture, and change. Uh, Kick off, what's the best piece of advice you could give talking about productivity? Well, um, well, for me, it all starts from clarity. It's about getting focused on on what we want. Um, You know, we spend a lot of time with clients where they think they're joined up. They think they're working on the same things when actually – they're, they're probably not, in which case, if you're not focused, then A, how can you be effective? And B, how can those around you be effective? Yeah, nice. Mm. Yeah, so you've got, to, got to understand where you're going. I, I think I would sort of add to that and go, most people then talk about how they improve or become better. And they spend a lot of time trying to sort of increase their capacity or increase their uh, skills or increase their um, abilities. And, and while they're really good goals, there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's actually a lot of hard work. And there are a lot of quick wins just dealing with the interference, the things getting in your way, particularly the stuff in your head that you know stops you being as good as you could be. And some of that stuff's quite easy to deal with if you focus on it. Yeah. So you're talking about um, getting out of your own way a little bit. Yeah, then. yeah, very much so. And I think, I think just to go back, I think that's a lot easier to do when you know where you're going. So if you've got focus and clarity, then actually you know when you're holding yourself back from where you want to be. Um, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with going, I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. That's a really admirable goal. But the real quick wings for me are about going, how do I get out of my own way? Well, we, we see a lot of a lot of clients who kind of skip. They They kind of think they've got clarity about where they're going they skip the creative parts in terms of how they might get there and get straight into um, some sort of action yeah what we're going to do then Um, and whilst that's an important thing to do if you don't do the creative thinking in the first place you're sort of in danger of making assumptions you're not really applying your thinking to all of the different options that you could explore some of the stuff where you could you know enable the team remove more interference, really sort of concentrate on some really interesting things. So, you know, the bit that I would put on the back of creative thinking is you do have to get to a plan. Of course you do. But the importance of pulling a plan together and being really quite specific and drilling down to the priority actions, the things, you know, what are you going to do? When are you going to do them by? Having the discipline about putting dates against things and actually attributing ownership or responsibility for certain individuals and getting the detail around the plan is, you know, stuff that in our client work, you know, is the thing that really resonates with me. You know, my one piece of advice is if you do lots of thinking and, you know, planning and prep and collaboration together, don't forget to pull a plan together and be really tight with that plan. I was going to say, just before you said that, I was just saying it's really interesting because a couple of these things all sort of jump back to the same thing, which is the, you know, I call it the busyness of business that, Actually, most people are, they feel much more comfortable just being busy. Hmm, yeah. You know, not stopping, not thinking, not getting focused on what they're doing, just running like crazy because they feel that that's them doing something. Busy busy means good. Yeah. 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 And I think that for me is, is almost that you can see that across even like the interference. Um, it's, it's that kind of drive, that almost culture of I have to be busy that is the single thing that gets in their way. Yeah. Well, on the on the back of that, there's a couple of things that the three of you have made me think about with your advice. So, I would say there's this argument, isn't there, about inputs versus outputs? Almost on the back of what you've just said there, Paul. Busy is good. We measure inputs. If someone's doing lots of stuff, 
and looks very busy, then that's good. But actually, I think we're moving more into a world now where people want to people want to work how they want to work in a way that allows them to be productive for themselves and for their team. And that starts to question whether actually we should be looking at what the output is that people are giving rather than how many hours they're putting into doing whatever they're doing. Mm. And I think that that certainly comes through strongly for me. And I would, some of the companies I work with, I, I, I do question with them, are they measuring the right things? So I think that would be one. The other one that I was thinking about prior to that is actually I think we're all more productive when we find meaning in the work that we're doing, when the work feels meaningful for us and it resonates with us. Now, maybe that is because you believe in what the organization does or the team does or whatever it is, or maybe it is because it provides some sort of sense of meaning for you outside of work. Maybe it's it's about the hours that you work or, or the money that you earn that allows you to live a certain lifestyle or spend time with family, friends, whatever that might be. But I certainly think if you want to be productive as an individual, you need to do something that feels meaningful. And I think if you're an organization or a team leader, you need to help people find meaning in the work they're doing. And that will help them be more, more productive. Now that links, I think, really nicely to to the key piece of advice I would give on leadership. So let's move on to to that second area of leadership. And the the thing for me there is, you know, the key to good leadership is making sure that you get people to understand the purpose, you know, understand what it is you're trying to achieve. So not only, you know, is the work meaningful to the individual, but it's meaningful to the group and and that people buy into what it is you're trying to achieve. And purpose i mean it always strikes me as it comes up in so much of the work we do in so many different ways uh, it you know it helps create direction and, and give people clarity yeah helps you deal with with uncertainty and when you're not sure what's going on at least if you know where you're going you know if things are working and, and moving you forward uh, giving you the scope to drive through change when we do change projects uh, people who have real clarity of purpose find change easier because mm-hmm. you're just asking them to do something better to achieve what it is they're really um you know trying to achieve so so that's my kind of big thing about leadership is can you really establish purpose the the higher purpose the real meaning of what you're trying to do um because why you're here is very different to what you're doing Mm. um and my experience is most people are attached to what they're doing not why they're doing it Well, I think that's a really good point because even Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, talks about the power of aligning people to your purpose because actually, as we've probably seen over the last few years, the what has to change Hmm. because we have to adapt to different circumstances, be that, you know, the pandemic, be that the economic situation. Organizations are making very different choices all of a sudden. But the purpose is the constant. Purpose is the bit that that we can all, you know, align behind, and therefore, people are less likely to find that change uncomfortable, like you say, Paul. Mm. I think I think organisations and teams often lose sight of it as well. Yeah. Maybe maybe they don't even think about it, but I think they do lose sight of it. So you're right. You know, why are we here? Let's ask that question. It's not. It's not what are we doing it's why are we here and then the what com- comes after that and and the as ricky said the what can change and i think that's why sometimes it, it, it's such a hard thing to do because you know you're going to go to a meeting every monday morning and talk about what do we need to do this week as a leader your job in that is to keep the why alive because there'll be lots of what conversations because they're tactical and they're all the time and it's really easy for the why conversation to be an annual event and it shouldn't be it should be an ongoing dialogue of this is what we're trying to do, guys. This is why we exist. Yeah. So to build on that, I think I've worked with a lot of leaders in the time we've done these hundred podcasts. One of the thing that off, one of the things that often sort of stands out for me is that sometimes we work with leaders who've been leading for a long time, very senior. Sometimes we work with people that are new to leadership. One of the things that stands out for me is that I would say about fifty percent of them have never really thought about who am I as a leader? Why should I be in this privileged position of leading other people? And what are my values as a leader? What do I stand for? What do I think leadership is about? Um, and I would, you know, as we're talking about sort of giving advice, I would put that out as a as an exercise to do. What are your values as a leader? 
How would you like people to feel when they're following you? How would you like to behave when things get tough? How do you want to, you know, lead in the good times? Um, to really, because I think if you if you don't do that piece of thinking, there's that phrase, isn't there? If you don't stand for anything, then you fall for everything. Yeah. And and I I don't see enough people being encouraged in organisations to think about who are you as a leader. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, Rich, because a lot of the time, and I think about my journey into leadership, you start off by copying other people. You start off by yeah, yeah. by mimicking the things around you. And some of that works for you, but not all of it. And finding out who you are is a really sort of challenging part and accepting that that probably means that you're going to see other leaders around you who are great at some things that maybe you're not. But that doesn't mean you're not a great leader. It just means you have different strengths. And it, you're connecting there to values then rich you're, you're sort of making that yeah that connection to values yeah yeah that deeper thought about what are my values and how do i believe i should do this so it's interesting because that's so closely aligned with with the sort of thing that that i was going to mention here which is about authenticity which i guess a, an easy description of that is that if you're an authentic leader you are showing your values you're sort of wearing them on your sleeve you're living by them yeah, your you know people have no doubt. You know your your followers, the people around you, your peers, have no doubt about what you stand for, because you're authentic in the way that you do those things. So you know authenticity for me is is a sort of a very key thing in terms of your communication um, and lining up your message with the the things that you then do, the activity that you take on the back of your message. So you know it's it's arguably very easy to use the right words but not actually follow that through with your actions and your deeds yeah and your and your and your actions and your deeds will show whether you're authentic won't they absolutely yeah i mean we must have all been in situations and certainly in the with the client work that we do where you'll go oh yeah nicely said but then we go back in and we have continued sort of interaction with you know a leader or a couple of leaders and they're not acting in accordance with what they said um, so, you know, they're not being authentic and, and that's a, a really key bit of advice that, um, I think I would sort of throw into the leadership part, you know, amongst the other things that it's important to do is to remain authentic. And it's really powerful because I, you know, I think if you said to somebody, well, what does authentic look like? Mm. It's quite hard to explain, mm. but one thing you do know is you can sniff out inauthentic in seconds, yeah. mm. you know, people spot it from a mile off and, and it's that. You know, when you get it wrong, you destroy trust. So it's such a powerful thing to to actually be, you know, be a leader who is being you and people can recognize that that's just you. Yeah. And I suppose that can be quite uncomfortable sometimes, though, can't it? Because there's this, um, particularly if you haven't thought about it, like you said, Rich, that actually, what am I supposed to be? Am I being what I believe others want me to be as a leader uh, of the organization, or how do I then bring my perspective, my values into play so that actually people see that I am authentic, to your point, Rob. Mm -hmm. And and, and I, I like the phrase um, that leadership is a privilege. So, so in order for that to be true, then you have to, for me, think about what that means to you. Like you just said there, Rob, you also have to follow through with that and be be truthful to that. And that can be difficult, Ricky, as you say, because there might be things you've got to do for your company yeah. that are at odds with the way that you might do that if if it wasn't or almost like, you know, dictated. So you've got to find an authentic way to get through those difficult things. And I think having values and knowing what you stand for enables you to do that. And all the way back to your point, Paul, purpose purpose is really good when times are difficult it helps you go back to it it helps you keep going it helps you push through so i think all these things line up nicely yeah ricky give us a different angle on leadership well i mean for me uh, we do a lot of work with leaders we do a lot of work with leadership teams and i always kind of say that their first obligation is to the organization so therefore their strength really does come from being aligned behind a shared vision and yes they will have some functional responsibility but that cannot 
override what's right for the organization. And I think, Richard, you alluded to this in, in what you said just, just a second ago, is actually you are going to make some difficult choices. That's what comes mm. with the territory of being a leader. And mm. But you've got to go, is that right for the, my team or is that right for the organization? And clearly, if you can achieve win-win, then great. But sometimes you will be making decisions that do put you and your team uh, in a difficult position. Um, but that's your first obligation. You have to be aligned around the shared vision of the organization and everything then using the purpose element that you talked about, Paul. You know, that's almost the barometer that enables to enables us to make robust decisions rather than just it's what we're doing type thing. Yeah. So alongside the um alongside the privilege of leadership is the responsibility of, of leadership. And those two things have to go hand in hand. Um and will be a a clear indicator of whether or not people are aligned. I like that little trick when you're with a leadership team, when you ask them what team are they in? And if they talk about the people who work for them, they've kind of missed the point that the team they're in is is the, the people sitting in the room with them. And and often that that's a group of people who don't do anything that you do. Because mm. you know, at the very top of an organisation, you all come to it with radically different skills. But as Tricky was saying, your responsibility, your commitment, is to the whole yeah. and to each other, not to your bit. Well, I agree entirely. Because I go, you are custodians of this organisation. It's on your watch that it will either move forward, um, and that might be at pace. It might stagnate, or actually worse, it might move move backwards but it's on your watch so therefore you know if you look at it through the lens of just your function how can that be a balanced decision robust for the organization or even worse ricky some people don't even look at it um through the lens of their own team or department or whatever they look at it through the lens of themselves what's best yeah. for me yeah you know fair point yeah. absolutely i think that's a really interesting point to switch to culture <laughs> uh, you know what drives all that uh so, Rich, give us a view on culture. What's the best advice there? Well, when I was thinking about this, uh, this is sort of closely linked to the the productivity one we were talking about. So in, in many of the cultures that we see in organizations we work with, it's all about action, results, get it done, move fast, grow, you know, focus on the goal, all that stuff. I'm not saying any of that's bad. Lots of that is really good. But what I've seen time and time again is that that is done at the cost of thinking about how do we want to behave? How do we want to be in pursuit of these goals, targets, objectives, whatever you want to call them? That, that is, and, and that's often a lot of the work we do, and we come in to do that with teams, sometimes when those teams have, have broken because they've been working so hard, because they've been pushed so hard. Um, and I think that's a really key question to ask for a team. It's right, we know, we know why we're doing it. We know what we're doing. But how do we want to be while we're doing it? And I think it's become even more prevalent recently because I think pandemic, global economic circumstances, all these things have caused a lot of burnout for people, um, have caused a lot of uh, challenges for people's resilience. And I think where you where you see teams that have, have just run really hard and run really fast and gone at it is where we see these things, where we see burnout, where we see resilience. We haven't thought about, okay, how do we want to behave while we're doing this? And I think there's also a challenge in that for organizations as we go forward and for teams as we, we move into the future, because I don't think future generations are going to want to work in the same way that maybe we have over the last 20, 25 years. I think they'll want a difference in that input versus output and choice over how they do things. Yes, I think, I mean, you know, they talk about this next generation being the experienced generation. And if you think about work being the thing you probably spend most of your time doing, you know, more people are going to go, well, is the experience of work, does that match what I want? As opposed to, do I just get the rewards I need? And I think there'll always be a, a mix of those things. But the the construct of how we approach work I think has changed dramatically over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. I think it moved us on maybe 20 years in some industries. Um, and I think we can't ignore that and just expect to go back to being how we were pre-pandemic. And that does mean for me that asking that question, how do we want to be 
as a group, as a team, whilst in pursuit of these goals becomes really important. It's interesting because the the pandemic has been a, a marvellous sort of social and business experiment that was never really designed to be such. Um, and if you think about... You would have never got through ethics. <laughs> really <would>. Never. <laughs> uh, what I was thinking about is, you know, remember right from the beginning, we, we, nobody really knew what to expect, but our sort of overall assumption was that it wasn't going to last long. And And if the pandemic had only been for four months or so, to your point, Rich, that you raised, we wouldn't have had this massive increase or, in, or, or, or in, if you like, improvement or, or progress made around, around people's culture and the way they approach work because we would have just bounced back to what we had been doing before. You know, mm. familiarity trumps mm. change every single time. So I, I think that's probably what would have happened. If it had only been a four-month or five-month or six-month pandemic, we would have just got back to what we knew. But because it was two years and two years and a bit long and still going on, it's causing that cultural shift in people's way of working, their way of thinking, et cetera, um, and making people reevaluate. Hmm. But I think it's creating some challenges for leaders, though, because they're like, well, we want you back in now. And of course, their people are probably going, well, yeah, but we've proved that we can still achieve lots. And do that in working in a way that suits us. Yeah. But leaders, particularly if you think about the backdrop of where we are right now, we've got challenging econ uh, economic situation. We've got um, conflict, um, you know, in in the Ukraine, etc. All of which is putting pressure on organisations in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, what's the answer to that for most leaders is to kind of double down and go, right, how do we bring people back in and use this as a catalyst to kind of get back to normal, even though Pandora's box is long since been opened and, and, and long gone in terms of achieving that, perhaps. Do you think in some ways, though, that's because they're trying to get back to the culture they know? They're not prepared to put the effort into going, what's the right culture now? The world has changed. We need to change the way we work. We need to change the way we we communicate and interact and, and the values that the organization has. I, I think that's that's probably right. And I think what might fuel that in some organizations is if they're feeling the pinch. If yes. it's if it's if you're in difficult times, maybe results aren't as good as you want them to be, there's a reverting to type thing going on. Yes. You know, which is bring everyone back in so we can see what everyone's doing. Now I understand the thing about bring people back together so we benefit more from collaboration because we lost a lot of that, didn't we? Mm. You know, teams that that talk ad hoc, meetings, conversations that spark ideas. I'm, I think that's all really valuable. But I think you've got to be careful that, you know, if times are tough and results aren't as good as they might have been and you've got all this stuff going on in the world that Ricky was just talking about, that we don't just revert to type and say, right, well, this is how we, we do it then. I think you're right, Paul. The questions you were asking are probably ones that, that need some difficult conversation and thought, and they're not ones we've got answers to really. So therefore, do we not answer them because we don't know the answers and we just go back to what we did before? Well, also, also, it's really challenging to stop and do that piece of work when your numbers are behind or you've got significant business problems. Yeah, and maybe the stock price has fallen and, and you're yeah. under pressure from, you know, you know, whichever stock market you're on, you know, you're under pressure. Well, I mean, you know, we've got organizations that, that we're working with right now where their their sales revenues are up, but the cost of utilities basically means that that increased profit is wiped out. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's wiped out. And you go, that's a landscape that they would never have foreseen going back 12 months ago when they were originally defining the goals for the year. And 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 to Paul's point, you know, is it is it about comfort is it about you know that we know what we know so therefore let's try and get back to that because because it kind of worked then well the the situation the the landscape has not changed won't change for the foreseeable future unless we're really lucky um and therefore actually it comes back to how do we create a strategy that works for us you know one that our culture can drive because you know, we, we know that Peter Drucker once said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it doesn't matter how good you think your strategy is. If your people aren't engaged and bought into the journey that you're going on, they will resist. And I think, Rob, you summed it up in that phrase, familiarity trumps 
change. So therefore, yeah. you know, it's easier to stay doing what I know, what I'm comfortable with, than it is to um, to shift and move and evolve. Um, you know, and, and your culture effectively is the acid test of how well you are progressing towards your strategy and your strategic imperatives. That's a really interesting perspective because that sort of almost explains why some leaders are going, I want everybody in the office. I want, I always think, we I was sort of joking inside that, that whole, remember Jacob Rees-Mogg going around putting little <laughs> notes on people's <laughs> desks. I came to see you. Um, and you can see what he's trying to do is go back to what he knows. Yeah, he's, he's being not accepting that the world has moved on, the culture has changed. And so he's trying to enforce or go back to saying, let's bring the culture back that I understand because that matches the strategy I have. Yeah. yeah. And if you, yeah. if you take that culture strategy for breakfast, if I'm not flexible in my strategy, I'm going to try and adapt my culture to the one I've got as opposed to going, my culture is my culture. The world has changed. The pandemic you know, the uncertainty that's driven out of the other side of the pandemic, we're still in this cost of living crisis. You know, it, it could easily change again in terms of the way people want to work. We don't know. As human beings, we crave stability, don't we? We crave we certainty. We crave stability. So it's, it's, a, it, it's a very ambitious thing as an individual to sort of go, oh, no, I'm not going to try and hold on to that comfort. I'm going to do things differently because our natural sort of way of doing things is to try to get stability back and try to get certainty back into our lives and that for me brings me to the one point i always notice about culture which is getting people to understand that you can say whatever you want i mean it's <laughs> almost irrelevant as a leader you can stand up and say our culture is this or that or because no one cares no one's judging your culture on anything you say they're judging it on the things that actually happen you know, if you if you talk about a learning culture, are people being given time to learn? Are people being encouraged to learn? And uh, we often talk about the the idea that actually there are four big things that come together around a, a culture: your mindset, your measures, your processes, and your rewards. And what we often see when cultures get moved is that one of those is stuck in the past. Mm. You know, it might be a sales plan that that reflecting how they've always done it, not where they're going. Or, or reports and meetings that reflect the old world, not the new world. And it doesn't matter what it is. And it doesn't matter what the reason is that you had to do it. The second you have one of those things out of alignment, mm -hmm. the culture will flip back to what people know because that's safer than changing and going somewhere new. Yeah, yeah. What I was sort of thinking about here as well is that we've so far sort of discussed culture as a sort of a maybe fairly larger thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of drive that down almost under the microscope and go, you know, let's not forget here that there are myriads of cultures, you know, so the organizational culture will be broken into, you know, business unit cultures or whatever. And that actually a business team, a project team, even a, a line manager with three or four reports, th there are those micro cultures that, it ex that exist within the overall culture of the whole organization. So, you know, it, this comes back to, you know, some of the things about, you know, culture driving strategy. You know, you, you might have a rogue manager within a within a business or a rogue leader who sort of is working with a silo mentality. Um, and there is a culture that that they are creating within their function or within their area that that team either is enhanced by or suffers from. <laughs> Um, because it's a it's it's a watered down version um, of the of the of the overall culture of the business unit or the organisation itself. Well, yeah, I mean, you see that all the time. I think it's a really, really interesting point, Rob. Because you go, when I think back to some of the culture, um, corporate culture I was involved in, you know, you could easily see the sales team had their own culture. Yep. You could see the operational teams had culture, their own culture. Mm -hmm. And and what you actually saw was a conflict in terms of yep. um, how they operated, how each of them thought they were there to effectively get in each other's way. And and that, look at, look at the waste in terms of effort and energy yep. fighting the cultures that exist within the business and then you kind of go well actually that goes back to the the section on leadership and around yes. you know being clear about what we want to be and why that's important and all of those things because actually our culture is the way we do things around here mm -hmm. and and we need to be in a position where we're brave enough to call out 
those um, misaligned cultures within individual teams. I might be violently agreeing with you here, but I think it's <laughs> inevitable. I think it's inevitable that you're going to get different cultures in in you know, like you described, sales and ops or whatever. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna get different cultures, and you're gonna that's going to happen because you've got different people working for different managers, doing different things in sometimes in different locations. So I think that's inevitable. But I think it's important to do the stuff, as I think you're alluding to, Ricky, at the end there, which is why are we here in this team? What are we trying to do? How do we want to behave while we're doing it? Who are our stakeholders? So we who do that we need to work with effectively? And and also in some of the work I've done over this last 12 months, 24 months, look at the corporate values. Yeah. So if you want to go and set up, you know, I've answered the question, how do we want to behave while we're doing this? And you come up with a set of answers that are wildly different from the corporate values, then maybe you've got a problem. Yes. But if you come up with a set of answers that complement them, build on them, enhance them, then I don't think you have got a problem because mm. it's all in line with where you're trying to go. Sure. Yeah, it links back to that golden thread piece, isn't it? If you, yeah. It doesn't matter that your team is slightly different to the team sitting next to you as long as there's a golden thread back to the organizational higher purpose, back to the organizational shared values, because you then are an expression or a part of a bigger whole. Um, it's where you decide your culture is going to be anti the thing that you sit within, yes. that friction and trouble gets created. Or, or yeah, you where cultures them. collide. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you go back to the four things that you mentioned, Paul, you know, mindsets, measures, processes, and rewards. And and particular functions in organizations may very well create their own, but with so much isolation around the way they've created them that they act against, you know, another part of the same organization. So this alignment piece is, is really critical to sort of go, well, if you're creating something, make sure it lines up with our overall. Well, how many, how many reward strategies, if you think about incentive schemes, actually cause one team to win and another team to lose and mm. that that were they were unintended consequences perhaps they weren't built into the original thought process but you know people are very good at working out how they can make the reward scheme incentive scheme work for them i think it, even worse or or as bad is when the reward scheme rewards performance yes. from someone who doesn't behave in accordance with what you'd like as the behaviors sure. in the team. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've yeah. seen that loads of times. But I am just making a note of uh, where cultures collide. I'm just going to write that down <laughs> that you said, Ricky, because I think that could be a, a good title for a, a podcast or maybe even a book. I think, so there's, I think there's a, so I think there's a few podcasts down. already out of this today. Um, let's um, round off with the last of the four areas and talk about change. So, um, Rob. Yeah, it really, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, the three areas that we've already talked about, how many times have we alluded to change or made reference to it? You know, because there is no such thing as not having change. You know, some people, you know, in my experience, I'm sure we share the experience, think that change involves, if you like, a specific project or it's a specific title for a, for a finite activity. Oh, we're going to introduce this change in this business because... Um, which which might be where some people get a little bit sort of antsy about change or they fear it or they get a little bit concerned about it because it's like an announcement's been made and we're going to change. But do you know what? Getting better at stuff, you know, our productivity piece, our culture piece, our leadership piece, if we want to get better at stuff, whether that's incrementally or, or wholesale, all of that involves change. You know, so we, we sort of almost need to demystify or take away the emphasis of the capital C, I think, on the word change and just go, look, all we're really talking about here is what is it you need to remove as an interference or what is it you would like to improve upon and recognize that that just means doing things a little bit differently. Right. Let's get some focus about what that is. Let's be creative and let's be critical in our thinking around helping people to make that improvement. And hey, presto, we're doing change. You know, it's just that we perhaps sometimes need to downplay the mysticism uh, or, or the scary nature of this change label that unfortunately sometimes gets banded around in organizations. I think I think that's right, Rob. I think, um, in fact, I don't think I know you're right. Um, you know, cha change is the only constant, right? So, So actually... You know, it makes sense to work out how do we do that, do that well. 
Yeah. You know, mm. and we we deal with a lot of organizations um around around change and they are probably more in that capital C perhaps in terms of you know they want to just force through the change we we've decided therefore it will be yeah. and and of course the problem with that is if you take your your phrase that i love you know familiarity trumps change actually getting people to move from one uh, way of doing things one mindset one cultural norm if you like actually requires them to move through a transition. In other words, they've got to let go of some stuff that is going to end yeah. whilst embracing the things that both will remain the same and perhaps some of that new stuff that will come in place of some of the stuff we're letting go. Because, you know, we've got to learn to let go of the stuff. And we're we're doing that with hopefully, with helpful intent, with with the view on to you, what you described as a better tomorrow than we were today. Yeah. I think it's really interesting, Ricky, because one of the things we see a lot is that people aren't given any time to stop, pause, think yeah. about the change they're being asked to do. And so they don't get to do that letting go. Yeah, They just diving into the next thing with the last thing still sitting there. That, that reminds me of a call I took some years back where the, a company had rang, rang in and they were looking for some help with a change program. And I said, oh, okay, so is this an ongoing change program? Oh, no, no, it's ongoing. Um, how long have you been going? Two years. We're two years into a change program. And well, what's the problem? It's not working. What, what do you mean it's not working? We're two years into a change program and it's not working because they had worked on the assumption that it is, therefore it will be, and people would just slot in. They hadn't factored in this time to understand what's changing, you know, what's no longer going to be the case, what's going to be different and what will remain the same. They didn't they didn't even consider that. Mm. And you think about that in cost of change terms, mm. how much that will have cost their organization because they haven't embraced a very which I mean we do it all the time, don't we? Is doesn't have to be months and months of work to do this actually we can start that process relatively easily yeah hmm. well they tend to layer it don't they They put one on top of another on top of another and yeah which which fits nicely with the thinking i was doing before this because I, I i'm not sure this is if you're talking about organizational change my number one bit of advice but it, it fits with what what you're saying here and i've seen a lot of this lately which is there's so much change going on in an organization in the industry in the world people have been through an awful lot of things that we've already talked about in this podcast over the last 12 24 months that you start to get what's known as change fatigue so it, there's just too much going on they become overwhelmed with it and that means that cognitively they don't process it properly and even worse we start to think oh i don't, I don't care anymore whatever yeah. i don't care anymore but I mean, you you think about some of the stuff that's happened in the UK when you know we've been through a very strange sort of last few months with different prime ministers and different chancellors and different budgets and different approaches to the economy and tax and all that sort of stuff. It's very easy towards the end of that. <laughs> not not that we're towards the end of it, perhaps, but <laughs> but it's very easy to just go oh, yeah. whatever, whatever, yeah. just sort it out. And that's change fatigue. And I think I think that is a real risk for organisations that, as you've just alluded to. Ricky, don't do this properly. Don't stop and think about what they're doing and how that will impact their people on top of whatever else might be going on in, in the industry or in, or in their organization. Well, and I think to that point, look how much money they're spending fighting the change with their people yeah. as opposed to helping them to transition and therefore save money in the long run. Because if you can if you can make that change curve that bit shorter or um and i mean shorter in terms of duration not necessarily in terms of that it will still go through the same shape of course but actually if we can if if, if you can take a month off it if you can take 6 months off it depending on what your how big and and bold your change agenda is actually you know even if you take a few hours off it it will all make a difference in the long run and they're spending this money that will never appear on the balance sheet they'll never see it in that way well, the other advantage to that is that, of course, that the one of the things that adds to change fatigue, to Richard's point, is that it, most of the 
changes that happen in an organization are just seen as one uh, as a series of initiatives and they all bleed into each other so nobody can really see where one began where they are in terms of the middle with another and when one might have finished or when it's going to be predicted to finish and it you know so that's a massive element to all of this as well you know not being clear about what it is you're trying to do on top of that and Paul, you can bring us to a conclusion in a second. But on top of that, what you made me think about there is that if if there's a lot of change going on for me in my life, work, home, industry, whatever, then that can feel overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And that overwhelming feeling can can challenge who I believe I am and what I am in the world. Mm-hmm. And that is quite difficult for people because I'm starting to question my identity, my worth, what I can do, what I can, what I can give, what I can provide, and 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 that really does become overwhelming and difficult for people. So I think it is a very important point for us to think about, not just as you said, Ricky. Let's just force it through. Let's just get on with it. And in big organisations, you can still think about every person by equipping the people, the managers in your organisation, to take time to do these things that you you were talking about in terms of helping people get through the transition phase of understanding what this means to them. I I know that um, if I had the knowledge I have now, I would certainly have done uh, some of the corporate change very differently to the way I did it back then. I think the challenge, Ricky, though, is that, you know, when you're leading a change project, it doesn't matter how good at this you are, you're always at the other end of the curve to the people that you're leading. Mm -hmm. You know, change at change at its heart is about loss and and your reaction to loss and and you know the, I think it's Ericsson who said you know sometimes when one door closes we're so you know so we spend so much time looking at the door that's closed we can't see all the doors that are open for us. Sven and that, Goran Ericsson. No, I don't think it was that one. <laughs> Do you mean Anders? Uh, no, not him either. It's There's the Ericsson who makes all the telephones, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that, it was that, that one. Yeah. yeah, light bulb Ericsson. Yeah. Ericsson. Anyway, light bulb Ericsson. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was Edison. Wasn't it? Oh, well, whatever. Anyway, yeah. keep going, Paul. I forgot where I was going with this now. <laughs> Power through. The, the, Power point, the point being is that, you know, we sometimes look at the people around us and go, well, they're just no good at change. And that's a misnomer. Everyone's great at change. Because if, mm. if we weren't, we'd mm. all kind of be driving our first car and living with our parents. And we clearly don't. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's actually what most of us aren't great at doing is dealing with the loss. And... As leaders, I think sometimes we have to help people acknowledge when things change, there is loss. That might be loss of relationships, loss of status, loss of power, you know, loss of being good at what you used to do because we don't do it that way anymore. But there's also opportunity. And I think sometimes we don't spend any time at all or nowhere near enough time because as the leader, we've already made the transition. We've already yeah. worked out what's in it for us. And we can't remember what it felt like to be at the other end of the change, to be at the start when it felt really hard. Let me build on that a bit because one of the things I've seen quite a bit and been working with, there's one particular team I've been working on with this um, very recently, is change is all about loss and it, it enforced change. If it's yeah. enforced on you, there's a lot you're losing. That becomes even harder to deal with if leaders, managers have not been able to create a compelling vision of what the future looks like. Yeah. So, so it's like you can only see the loss. You can't see the I can only see the loss. I can't see yeah. it's like looking this the way the way I describe it is it's like looking out of the window on a foggy day. You don't know what's out there, yet you're asking me to go and walk out there. So that is that is one of the jobs is yeah, you've got to help people come to terms with what they've lost because they haven't chosen to lose it. But your duty is also not to force people out side into that foggy day but to clear the fog out the way and help them see what that opportunity might be for them and i think that kind of brings us to a nice end of we only really talk about four things we talk about productivity leadership culture and change the reality is we don't do any of those really we only do all of them because just how connected was that conversation Hmm. yeah yeah they're they're, they're all they're all interlinked all interlinked yeah and it, it, you know, comes back to the whole thing about removing interference, isn't it? You know, that's where we put value in our work, and that's that's what makes it enjoyable, but also impactful. 
So that kind of draws to conclusion our hundredth podcast. Thanks for sticking with us. I think this is probably the longest podcast we've ever done, and probably will be the longest podcast we do ever do, or maybe maybe we'll, we'll beat it when we get to two hundred. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think there's lots of topics in there that if you'd like us to explore a little bit more, uh, let us know. You can contact us at hello at thinkingfocus dot com. Email us. Tell us what you think. Tell us what topics you'd like us to talk about. And from me, and from Ricky, and Rich, and Rob, thank you for listening to a hundred podcasts. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. To find out how Thinking Focus can unlock the potential within your organization, go to www.thinkingfocus.com, where you'll discover more about the work we do, helping our clients increase productivity and enable change.